My name is Clayton Ryan, and I'm glad to join the Cape Collective on the Story and Song series here tonight at Henry Roy Gallery in downtown Rapid City. song about all the best friends in your group, the rowdy ones, which are always the more fun ones, right? Uh, this next song is uh, it's a brand new one. That one was a brand new one, and this one is too. Good old song about uh, meeting, meeting people of a romantic type, and, uh, and this song is for my lovely partner, Hannah. Have you ever watched a storm rolling? Saw the tall black clouds, felt the blowing wind, and I did when I met you in this town. And I was unprepared like a house in a flood, and the levee 
broken Shed my blood but you carried me back to dry ground And I learned right then and there That not everyone is an engine in need of repair Oh, but she's got the mind to know that life is more than just digging holes To throw all your treasures away And I know when the odds aren't fair that she's not going anywhere And I love her till they return me to the ground Well, I know that you don't need me but thank God you want me around Didn't know what I was fighting for Always felt the world loved me more than I did Till you snapped me out of that dream Maybe it was luck or some design that some wicked woman stole this heart of mine before the line broke and drifted downstream. Maybe I'm a foolish young soul bound to keep overflowing this bowl. Oh, cause she's got the mind to know that life is more just digging holes throw all your treasures away oh but I know when the odds aren't fair that she's not going anywhere and I love her till they return me to the ground oh but she's got the heart of stones to shake some life in these tired bones and weigh me from Long and dreary sleep You can take me to a city of gold But next to her it looks so dull She's the greatest treasure I've ever found Well I know that you don't need me But thank God you want me Thank you very much. This resonator guitar was the guitar that really spawned a lot of my songwriting. Really, it started the, the whole career. So it's fun to bring it back on board. But I do not miss all the tuning issues. really depends on which key you're in. Destruction, sorcery of death, construction. In the fields, the bodies burn dead as the war machine keeps turning. Death and hatred to mankind. Yes. 
questions have themselves away. They only started the war. Why should they go out onto the fire? They leave that road to the poor. Time will wait on their power mind. They wage war just for fun. Treating people just like pawns and chairs. Wait until the judgment day comes. Oh, yeah. Turning ashes where the body's burning. No more war pigs have the power, ah, and the God struck the hour. Day of judgment, God is calling on the knees of war pigs crawling. Begging mercy for the safe. Satan left in spacious ways. Oh, Lord, yeah. Oh, much. I remember being on the road in 71 with Sabbath and we wrote that song. It was a magic moment. <laughs> I like writing songs about uh, my friends from Iowa, the ones I grew up with, and how those uh, things I like about all those people cross over with a lot of my friends here and my life post-Iowa.
Want to go back to those hot summer nights Walking barefoot on the city lights Taking a tote till the stars turn bright Quietly pacing and taking in the sights Now I know that my age ain't that old But times like these were more precious than gold Friends and lovers hear the wild call. None of us making sense of it all. Thank you very much. I'm going to do two more and sit down and talk with Dex about music and story, the other part of the story and song series. song about the time I uh, worked on a railroad. Getting used to waking up early. Hope you don't mind staying out late. You are no friend of the sun. Some days it gets hotter than hay. I can't even hear myself think. Well, them times won't get replaced without everyone on the line. Well, I hear that there's good pay. Well, just don't lose your head in the meantime. fields with an axe and a shovel just like our fathers did there's dark storm clouds on the horizon 800 and we'll call it quiz oh out in the downpour i can't even hear myself think well then tags won't get replaced Without everyone along the line When I hear that this good pain Well, just don't lose your head in the meantime Today I thought I might die My ears were pounding the pain like knives And I thought that my grave Would lie lonely on the side of that grave Seeing stars, my head throb Wondering what it feel like if my heart did Stop reaching out to the black And I don't know what brought me Six on, then we'll get down for shut eye. Come back and then we'll do it again. Those tracks <coughs> won't get replaced without everyone on the line. Well, I hear that this could be. Well, just don't lose your head in the meantime.
not a not a good time to be coughing on live camera. <laughs> what the? Is it in you? That's how we get that Gatorade sponsorship. I'm sweating. I just need to be sweating red. Thank you. Made it through.
thanks to Hannah and Josh for operating the camera and audio while we're chatting. Clayton, that was awesome, man. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That was uh, it's cool to do stuff like this in a setting like this that's just so, it changes the way you think when you're looking around. It's like it's a different atmosphere. It's, it's like, what, how do I want to talk to this room? Yeah. That's what it feels like. Exactly. No, that was a complication <laughs> I didn't think of when we were planning out the story and song series and we're going to do it at a different downtown business every week. Yeah. And every building's got different acoustics and different lighting and just the way that you do everything on the production side of things is different too. And I imagine that's increased multifold when you're performing in a space. Definitely, I think, and my body thought coughing was how to talk to the room today, but that's okay. <laughs> that's how it goes. Yeah. yeah, if you have a live audience, it's almost guaranteed you're going to cough at some cough point. At you some can point. just cough, not cough all week, and then when the moment you're in front of that camera. Been here for 10 months, and you would think I'd be used to dry air by now, but nope, not no, at all. No, but that's not what, one bit. That's what Gatorade is for. So Gatorade, if you're listening, it's the thirst quencher, and it can cure all your winter ailments. So... We could really use a sponsorship from Gatorade if Is you're watching. Is it in you? <laughs> so Clayton and I have had a couple cool experiences. One of the things that, I don't know what stories that you want to talk about tonight, but I've got a couple stories I want to talk about. Yeah, I, uh, we definitely have had a past. There's, what, what are you thinking of in particular? <laughs> well, so we, we posted about it on the Instagram today and shared about it on Facebook, but the first time that you played the Cave Collective, you opened for a, a punk band, a hardcore band out of <laughs> Omaha. I did. Yeah, called, called Death Cow. They're super great. You should check them out. Death Cow. And uh, so whenever you do those kind of mixed bill shows, you never know how it's going to go. But um, remember, you performed a song. Well, why don't you tell the story of how you saw it that night? Because it was, it was really cool to see that happen with all those kids. Yeah, it was definitely a unique experience because from the start to finish, it was just like a, it's a very homely experience at the Cave Collective. And so from the moment I got there, there was like a pot of uh, some sort of some vegan chili that was up there. And me and the band just met just sitting up there gorging on that chili. And I probably had five or six bowls without a doubt, which was it's always unwise before playing. But it was so it was so good. And I think Natasha made that. And it was just so good. Yeah, Natasha good. comes to all the bands that come through. And we're all just sitting there trying to get to know each other. But just like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, sure, whatever. Just like chilling, like cramming chili down our throats. Like, right, hold on a second, I gotta get this bowl. But and I went and I I played uh, the opening set, and it's the audience is just it's everyone from local musicians and like older f older people that are just parents that want to come in, and then we had you know and kids there, and so it was a fun blend, and everyone was down that night to follow me and a little bit of some acapella singing as a group, and there's this great video, probably on both of our social medias about us like me getting off stage and going unplugged and just playing the end of that last song, I suppose it's the end, getting everyone in singing at the end, just in like a half circle around. And then, of course, as you mentioned, yeah, I, I got into a mosh pit after that, and I've never been thrown out of a mosh pit by a 13-year-old girl before, but there's a first time for everything, and that was the first time. The girls in Rapid City go hard in the mosh pit. I think, I think people all over the country could take exa example from <laughs> Rapid City mosh pits. Um... Yeah, that was just a really special night, and I felt like it so epitomized what the Cave Collective is all about, the idea that different people from different backgrounds can come together and celebrate their commonalities. And I felt that just epitomized that so well that night. Absolutely, isn't it? And uh, to sort of tie it in, you know, it's such an important thing right now, obviously. It goes without saying, goes without delving into that, that sort of unity <coughs> that you can only get consistently at music con music events, concerts, and all that is just so unique, and I think that's why a lot of us do it. Oh, yeah. That's why a lot of us do, us do it, I should say. Absolutely. That's, that's something that just, um, Natasha once said that connect, the music makes a connection that you can't get elsewhere, and, and, y and you see it a lot of times, too, when people, you know, everything's politicized nowadays, and you'll have musicians who are very political, but they have fans who might disagree adamantly with their politics but they love their music and their art enough where they're not just a uh, two-dimensional character of a person they're i think art kind of fleshes us out and makes us more real to people yeah absolutely it does uh, because i don't know, regardless of ideology art is something that comes out naturally and comes out from the depths of somewhere 
that animals besides us don't have. So it's like <laughs> that's that's something you can't pin to any sort of party, any sort of you know political movement or anything. It's just it exists. And there's people that harness it, and there's people that harness it in the ways that you would not think typical of like artistry, you know. There's, th you know, the 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 best electrician in in the town is an art of a sort, you know. And that's, it's a, people should not be afraid to to own that and say that, you know. It's like I, you're an artist in your own field. And, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, if, remove all the parties, and we're all just artists. Oh yeah, that's something that I, I've been. Uh spending some of this time during quarantine plumbing our house and redoing some of the plumbing. And you realize what an art that is. When you, when you look at, you know, I'm not a plumber, I'm not sk uh, skilled in it, and uh, it's, it's apparent. <laughs> 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 and you sometimes don't realize the artistry that goes into something and just the, the craftsmanship. I think that's something that we have lost touch with so much nowadays with so much being produced in China and overseas in general. That the you know that's a craftsmanship is a very unifying thing, and art just like building a piece of furniture or doing electricity, um, it's it's creation, and I think it should be acknowledged in general. Absolutely. So, what have you been up to while you've been in quarantine? I haven't seen you since uh, it was like what three months ago when we shot that music video. Th yeah, because we shot that at the end of August, right? That sounds about right. We yeah. were we were cutting it down to the wire <laughs> out there, getting that video done. But uh, I mean, just since then, it's been in a in a r underground, hunkered down writing mode because I've got s plenty of songs that I was thinking of going and recording, but the the uh, craft of songwriting is something I'm trying to learn to do almost every day that I can. Every day I can. It should be an everyday thing. You know, they say if you want to be good at something, do it every day for so many years. And that's when, you know, you know if you want to do it and you're ready. And so I've just been honing into the whole industry standard, you know, like w ways of writing songs and writing and actually like not just like playing and sitting down and thinking, oh, that's a cool idea. Like cataloging a collection of copies of songs into into a uh, folder and having that as a physical portfolio of things to choose from because some of my favorite artists that I know of spent years like Chris Stapleton for example spent years just producing and writing songs and then started performing and when his first album Traveler he and his wife just went through all of his songs I, I can't even I don't even want to throw out a number because I d don't want to <laughs> lowball it but going through all these songs he had built up and picked like, here's nine that'll do it and honing in that experience. So I'm just trying to do that right now because without a lot of shows are going on right now, other and just the only things I've been able to really do are sort of distance promotional appearances and all that. So really it's just been a time to sit down and learn how to be a legitimate songwriter. That's uh. <laughs> I forget who it was, but there's a, a story in songwriting a, about, um, I want to say it might have been John Prine, but somebody who basically he was having writer's block, and so his wife um, rented him a hotel room and locked him up there and said, you're not coming out of this hotel room until you've finished your album. And, uh, you know, with that kind of solitude, you, you end up finishing it. And if we all just think of quarantine as one giant hotel room. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to give her any ideas, so if that's probably the m the minimum or like the lowest threshold for her ideas that she's come up so far. That's so a safe one. Should I like, give you a call in a week or two if I don't hear from you? Yes, please. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Solidarity. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask Ryan? So real quick, so he, he yeah. the audience can't hear people out there. So, um, so Josh had asked um, with that guitar, uh, Jack White had once said that like when you have a guitar that's kind of hard to play or difficult to work with, you have to conquer it. Um, and just kind of asking about your experience with that guitar. I love 
this guitar and want to throw it in a river at all times. And I bought this guitar when it was after my freshman year of, or it was after my sophomore year of college, and I saw it at a guitar shop. And I spent all the money I had on it. <laughs> like, it literally, I, I was in between houses, so I was living in my car, and I spent all the money I had <laughs> on this and guitar. That's the time to do it, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe it's because I thought I'd tell this story years later, but, and I, and I, and, uh, I just wrote a couple songs on it, and I played my first ever show at the Octopus on College Hill in Cedar Falls, Iowa. I just played three songs opening up for, for uh, Matthew James and the Rust Belt Union, and uh, it, uh, that started it all. That really started it all was just buying this guitar, and it has, it has a voice that's so unique. And unfortunately, I, years later, I still have not found the right way to capture its voice and play it live because you know, the resonators are just incredibly hard unless they've got built-in pickups or that are made for the specific instrument. You know, it's, it's incredibly hard to dial them in. They have terrible feedback problems. The EQing is awful. It's a sound guy's nightmare, this guitar. And I've, I have just have since kept it as the home body. And for things like this where it's intimate and you have the capacity to mic something. And uh, no, I, and I'm, finally getting close to figuring out this beast of a guitar and it is it is hard to play it is very hard to play and and uh you know oftentimes i think i'm still not ready to play it because you gotta you can't just go to town on this guitar you've gotta it's a very dynamic instrument and it it actually requires just as much delicacy as it does require physical force playing it and the thing weighs 10 pounds but uh is it made out of solid metal yeah the body is made out of solid copper and there are three uh, tin tricones in it. That's how it gets that bright, really metallic sound. And it's just an absolute beast of an instrument. And if I can figure out how to get this thing so I could hook it up and play it live, you know, just I, I was met messing with a little custom. I took a Seymour Duncan just guitar pickup that goes in the sound hole of an acoustic guitar, and I've been shaping it and thinning it down to fit the profile of this instrument, and then fitting it or um, uh, fitting it so that I can run it through the body of the guitar and it's close it's the closest I've ever had if I run it through a bass amp it's it's perfect and that will completely if I can get this thing going it's going to completely change my sound to something quite it's funny you say that kind of close to I was thinking Jack White I love just a little bit more of that raw industrial rock just grit and so if I can get this thing going that's the direction I'm headed that sounds really for, awesome for a, for a bit I, th I think I want to hear that album. Yeah, I'll see you guys on the other side of that. <laughs> so ha have you been recording anything during this time or mostly just focusing on writing? Part of my songwriting process includes putting demos down. In, uh, on, I, use, I use GarageBand because it's so quick and streamlined. And Pro Tools is, is for the heavy hitting, you know, actually I'm going to record something for real. But I just, GarageBand, you can just open up a, a, a template that's got a drummer already in there and you just set the metronome and it's surprisingly very customizable enough that you can get the, the drummer to do exactly what you would want on the recordings. And I just, I lay them down real quick and, and simple in there after I've maybe written down lyrics and just kind of go through and come up with different parts and mess around and make these real rough demos. And it just kind of helps me not only have the song sheets, the lyric sheets categor or cataloged, but also to have an actual catalog of demos that if the, the event arises where I say, hey, you know, this next weekend I'm recording, I can just share that folder and it's all going to be there with little explanation we could get them recorded. So I spend a lot of time doing that. And of course, in my studio, I don't, I don't have uh, the room for a drum kit. So it's just having that ability to have a D, you know, a passable sounding drum kit for a demo is great. So that the recording you did for Fight the Tide, was that done at your home studio? It was, yeah. And that in GarageBand? Uh, no, that one was okay. done in Pro Tools, okay. yeah. I did that one in Pro Tools. And that one, that one was really fun because it, uh, I was trying to be minimalistic with it and make something just really well mixed and where I wouldn't look back and think, oh, I, I can't believe I missed that little... Uh, you know, that little pick sound that I didn't EQ out, or I can't believe that I didn't edit out that 
big old breath before a phrase, you know, like, and something. And I'd had that happen before in previous recordings, and the, the focus was on just, this has to be a clean, good, pretty much like second introduction of my music. And I had, you know, I had this guitar was on that one. My, my Taylor acoustic is the main instrument. And then, I, you know, I played the upright bass on the recording as well. And so having all those instruments in just a small room, you look around and think, how could I use that? How could I use that? How could I use that? So the slide guitar on that song, is that your resonator? Mm -hmm. I thought that was a lap steel. No, it was just uh, that's amazing. Yeah, it was just this thing, and I and I, j I panned it way off in the distance with a lot of verb. It's it's as one of my friends Roger said, it's the part where someone just like picks up, and plays this guitar in an old ballroom, like the ghost of someone plays this guitar in an old ballroom, and that's what this guitar can capture. That mm -hmm. it's just acoustically, of course. Yeah, so I'm just going to do a quick plug. Um, Fight the Tide by Clayton Ryan is out on all streaming platforms, and there's a music video filmed by the cave's own Dustin Human that is also available on YouTube and probably the Clayton Ryan Facebook page too, right? Yep, anywhere. The, the Instagram, Facebook, on my website. And uh, also plug, yeah, you writing that was wonderful, and Dustin, you know, being the overall tech engineer was wonderful. So plug you guys for your skills in well, doing that next time people cool need a video. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really great time. Yeah, Dustin, it's really amazing to work with Dustin. He's so incredibly talented. Um, you mentioned just now that this was like a reintroduction of your music. Now, I don't know, I, I only met you within the last year and a half, two years or so. Um, so you recently moved to the Black Hills and you've been playing music for quite some time elsewhere, right? Yeah, I, I went to school for music at the University of Northern Iowa, and I, I've been a musician performing since since I was 12 and <coughs> playing along the blues backtracks for my dad and his friends while they were cooking out, and uh, <coughs> which is still one of the top paying gigs I've ever done. But <laughs> but um, yeah, I I was just doing solo stuff before I went to college. Then of course I was mainly involved in the jazz bands and the and the orchestra and small groups. And of course, I, I it was 2016 that I sang when I first bought this guitar. And r around then is when I really began doing this dual life of being an a academic musician playing, you know, Dvorak, Beethoven, and, you know, Count Basie and, and uh, contempor all these contemporary jazz groups that would come through and these artists and we'd play with them. But I was also booking gigs, you know, learning how to send a cold email, learning how to build a, cr a press kit, playing in a rock and roll band at the time, just and uh, touring around Iowa and playing. So it was this dual life of being a session academic musician and then kind of getting all the real life skills of playing outside of the academic circuit. And so that rock band went until about the end of this year. And then I started the solo project or excuse me, the end of last year. I started the solo project and just had a bunch of songs that had been bouncing around my head for a long time that really weren't good for the rock band. And I thought, oh, I'll just table them for another time. And that time came. And so I got a bunch of those recorded about a year ago, you know, about two weeks before today. And it was a, it was a good experience because that was the first time I'd been in a studio where it's like you have one day to get as much tracked as possible versus the previous band. We spent hundreds of hours on the album which is fine if you have time to collaborate and, and you have the money to spend, but we did not. And so it w this has been a lot more of a positive experience, more professional. Sure. The, you know, we have a really, I'm, I'm very grateful to be a part of this. I hate the word scene, but music scene. Um, I feel like there's something very special here. And what I, I, it kind of ties to my next question for you. I, and I'm sure you've seen it a lot more because I know that you have played in DIY clubs and things like that that mostly play punk and metal shows. You also come from this background of country music, folk music, and then at the same time, you have this academic background. And I, 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 I've seen these worlds largely stand alone. There doesn't seem to be much cross-pollination, and I think that's something really special about the Rapid City region that the Cave Collective is trying to expand on is the way that we all kind of work together. You're seeing, you know, metal drummers sitting in on a folk rock passion project, stuff yeah. like that. Um, how have you felt the Black Hills region has, has shaped your songwriting in that way and just your approach to the music industry? Well, besides 
playing on my own, I also play bass in the Brandon Jones band and touring around and, and like everyone in that band is killer. They're, you know, they, they all had their own experience. They're all so good. Yeah, they, they all had their own experience in school and, and playing out in the circuits of their various, you know, where they come from. And realizing that there's this perfect threshold where you can, you can still be the talented musician or be the uh, academic musician that studied classical and jazz and all that, and you can still go do all those things. And you can also learn how to just like write a song that people are gonna like, and write a song <laughs> and write a song. You know, not say people uh, people love those other kinds of music, but like everyone, I don't know. We get so caught up in our art. And and I, especially coming from that background, everyone's trying to experiment with things in, in, in school and trying to really try and be real, what's the, what's the word, uh, thematic about everything. And it's just nice to be in a band or to be also living in a world, in a region, excuse me, and in a music scene where people just want to hear some rock and roll. Like they don't care that what's behind it. They don't care the story you've been through. They just, they like how things sound. And so, for the first time in my life, I'm really learning to respect even more things about the jazz and classical music, because I also because I I can enjoy it at surface value, and not worry that there's other people that are gonna think that my opinion of it are, is not deep enough. Or, I don't, and, and I love all those things. Don't get me wrong. Like I could go on for hours about about classical music and jazz and just the nuances of all that. But at the end of the day, like people, no one cares. Well, it's terrifying to talk about it because I, I listen to jazz and classical music and I really enjoy it, but I'm really afraid to talk to anybody about it because either they're going to be like, you listen to classical, yeah. or they're going to know way, way more than me. There don't seem to be a lot of like just casual classical <laughs> and jazz fans. Yeah, yeah, that is that is kind of a, that's, that's a black and white scenario right there. No, I, I get that. Well, and it was, it was just kind of frustrating in a lot of ways in school because to not be taken so seriously for what you're doing outside of that, you know, and it being dismissed as, as lesser or less educated or less refined, and, you know, and people go into music school with strong opinions, like freshmen go into music school with strong opinions, things like Shirley Parker's not even that good. <laughs> and you're like, what, Ex what? You're from, you're from, you know, Clorinda, Iowa. What do you know about <laughs> anything? And it's just so weird because, you know, it, it, we, all, we all do those things when we're young. It's, it's not just like music, but being surrounded by it 24-7 and just that it's just it's so it's funny more than it is destructive or damaging to the scene. It's just really funny because people grow out of that or they get phased out of the scene. And so living that dual life has been super great for being able to draw inspiration from all of it, from all of it. You know, you can hone it. You can hone it in when you're playing with the Black Hills Symphony, and then you can write just a, a killer rock song when you're in the Brandon Jones Band. You know, and I hate, I just hate when people put boxes around yeah. anything, but especially musicians, because it's, well, it's no one knows anything about anything. We know we don't know anything. Well, that's one thing I see constantly is like you think about this like massive bridge between like let's say country music and punk rock, for example. But you see it again and again and again, and I'm sure you've got a couple of friends, where these guys who used to be in hardcore beatdown bands are now playing in alternate country bands. Like, it's it's a pretty consistent thing where like you yeah. find hardcore kids playing in country bands by the time they're in their mid 30s. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's no exception with the bands around here. You know, Brandon Jones band. You know, the the guitar player Tom can play any style, any like any with the Tom's school. Amazing. Tom Freer, like Tom you guys Freer. should look him up. He's incredible. He's got a new album out too. I he think he does. Yeah, it's called Number One. Number One. So he knows it. <laughs> so to keep, he's keeping him cataloged. No, it's it's uh, yeah. No, it's it's just like musicians like that. You can play any sort of music with them, and they and they don't look over their nose at playing Chris Stapleton and um, Charlie Daniels music, stuff like that. And it's so fun to play, and it's so fun to also be paid well to play it too. And that's a huge thing is that people, if, you know, that's at the end of the day, you know, you're an artist, but at the end of the day, you can't pay your bills with ideas and you can't pay your bills with inspiration. So mm -hmm. people need to be okay just shutting up and doing your job. And because that's why, that's why we can, we struggle to get people to respect musicians in a lot of ways and why you're finding problems even getting someone to respond to your cold email 
is because, you know, we're, there's, they think that a lot of people are just this high-minded, just they don't care about the money, like it's all for the art. And that's how you can easily make it so that, yeah, we're a cheap commodity versus a profession. That's something that we're looking forward to. One of my favorite things about having the nonprofit status for the Cave Collective is that we're going to be able to get grant funding to start paying all of our local bands that come through. That's going to be huge because, you know, when you're playing with a touring band, you got to make sure that that band's got money for the road. And uh, it's hard to find that split. But um, I think a lot of young artists, like, I remember when I first got paid for a gig, like, I thought you were supposed to pay to go play a show. Well, and, and that happens some places, too, and that's, that's just, Insane. that's robbery. That's, that's just, you know, and it's tough because people still go do it. <laughs> and so they can keep doing it. But at the same time, you got to do it sometimes to, to get the exposure. And, uh, at, you know, I don't know. It's, everything has to be taken on a, on a cost effectiveness, a uh, cost effective basis if you're booking gigs. And you just got to decide how much you're willing to be paid or pay mainly to do to do what you're doing because if you love it you don't mind spending money but at the same time you also don't want to be taken for a sucker right <laughs> so it's it's so it's so tricky too and exposure is sa I, I i never thought i'd say this but exposure if if you're not getting anything out of something but you know that's a that's a lost gig but if you're getting the exposure from it and it didn't cost you that much then uh, everyone has to do it i'm sorry but that's just you got to pay your dues in some senses of like like that like you got to just do a gig where you're not getting paid you got to it's you don't deserve to be paid for a gig that you bring it if you can't bring it at an unpaid gig it's it's building up that karma capital we talked about yeah yeah because if it, things and i used to i used to be terrible at this where i would think where i would be in a show where there would be five or six people there and I'm just already disappointed at the beginning of the night. It's like, well, this is dumb. I don't even need to try tonight. And then you play the gig and you feel terrible because you didn't play well. And then it ends up you thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't be paid and maybe I shouldn't have, maybe I should only have six people if I'm not going to try when there's just six people. And I used, and I got, I found myself doing that. And I was just getting so tired of playing gigs on Wednesday nights for sev seven people eating dinner that just didn't know you were even going to be there. And, uh, I'll let, yeah, if you if you can't go to that same show where there's seven people there and play it like you're playing for ten thousand people, you don't deserve to have even ten people in the room. Right. I had to learn that the hard way and get over. It's, it's an ego thing. It's oh all yeah. an ego thing. It's yeah. like I I should be here by now. I, I should be making we thousands. See, we see ego getting in the way of art. I mean, look at the Beatles. Like yeah, <laughs> you see you see it left and right. Like I mean, that's like the tale as old as time. Is you know, pride cometh before the fall. And it's consistent. The moment you think that you're better than your audience, your audience stops listening. Yeah, ab absolutely. It's everyone needs an ego check, and and I think, quite frankly, I think the pandemic has been a good example of that because there's been a lot of people coming out of this that don't want to do it anymore. Because if a lot of us uh, were the first things to go, you know, when when this went down, you know, I know in in a period of 36 hours, I lost two tours that were booked in, you know, across the, U the U.S., you know, North Carolina, Ohio, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and, and just going all around. And then I also lost the Black Hills Symphony that I was playing in was gone. And I was also in the Firehouse Theater, and our production was gone too. And this was in 36 hours. So a lot of people had that story, that same story. And so I think a lot of people might not be so keen to, to want to go through that again and it's going to kind of filter out a lot of people i think it will i'm really looking forward to seeing uh really excited audiences at shows once all this is over like i think so often you know we'd have these shows and a handful of people show up and i really i'm looking forward to seeing uh i guess people really appreciate what they had now that we have not had it for a short period of time um i'm excited to see that resurgence I think we're uh, getting close up on 45 minutes here. Are there any last minute thoughts that you wanted to share before we finish up? Uh, I just think it's really cool what you're doing here because the intimacy of a, of a setting like this is really refreshing and it is one of those factory resets for us mu for musicians because you get so used to if you've got a band 
having other things to rely on to help bring together your sound. And I think a lot of people, when you're like put in that situation where it's just you, realize, oh, I need to shake the rust off for real because I, it's just me. And so this was a this was what that felt like for me tonight. And uh, now I was super. It's super cool that this is going on. It's uh, I never would have thought. You know, the the music scene in the in South Dakota is is small, like way smaller than where I came from. But there's it's very. Uh, Tight knit. It's very tight knit. Although I will say this, 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 this has happened a few times, and I've seen it, and I don't get it. And maybe this is something that goes on elsewhere. And I'm, of course, I don't, I don't want to call anyone out, and I'm not going to. But it's like I've never been to a place where I've seen several groups that play, and but it's people that don't like. The, uh, I don't know how to say. It. They have the guitar, but they don't play it. I've seen it several times, and it's the strangest thing. And I've, and I've talked to people about it. And, it d and most people just don't even know, but I've seen it happen. It's so strange. Like they're not playing it at all, like, like the, whole, the whole show? They've got the guitar, but it's not being played. It's just like it's, it's not plugged in or the tuner's on, and, and it's just so strange. And they've they got great voices, a lot of all these people I've seen, and, that, and like, that's a good enough thing right there. But just, I don't know. It's weird. I've, I've seen it here, and I don't know what to make of it. I know personally, <laughs> like um, – Josh and I have a band, and on songs that I don't play my guitar, I have to have the guitar still on me because I can sing okay, but the moment I'm not holding a guitar, I get really concerned about where my hands are supposed to be going right now. Yeah. So just having that just to kind of hold on to. Oh, like, no. It's like I a security blanket. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe that's it. That's probably it. Yeah, no, that, yeah, I just, I had to say, I had to ask you about that. Have you known, because I've seen that, and it's just, it, it's so strange. And, like, again, that's probably, like, of that academic thing like the <laughs> snootiness like going on but it, yeah it's not it's not all good being in both worlds there well you know <laughs> Fr freddie mercury often had a guitar on and would not play at the whole show so maybe they're just huge freddie mercury fans and trying to hey that find what you like and emulate it <laughs> <laughs> that's right well hey i really want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight for this um when we shot that video with you like the music moved me so much and you know you, you have that initial interaction with someone you first meet them the first time you played and just to get to, get to know you as an artist and a person over the last year or so has been a real pleasure and i'm very grateful for you coming down and having this conversation with me tonight absolutely thanks for having me yeah so this has been the story and song series with our friend clayton ryan uh the cave collective will be putting on the next story and song series next sunday at 7 p.m we're going to be hosting it at ernie november and uh, Wyatt Finner will be our guest that evening. So we will see you next Sunday at 7 p.m. on Cave TV for the Story and Song series. Thanks again, Clayton. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>